So hey, look, I want to um, I want to start today uh, uh, by talking a little bit about family, the influence of family growing up. Uh, you know how they can shape who you are, or or you know impact you in a negative or positive way. I know personally, I have my you know uh, uh, my family that had a, a huge impact on me, and I've got my own kind of uh, part of it. But why don't you walk us through kind of your upbringing and and, and like um, how that had an impact on who you are today, and 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 you know the influence on it. Oh man. Well, uh, growing up in a small town in British Columbia, Canada, you know, a uh, typical blue collar town called Trail. It's an amazing place. It's on a river. It's a fishing place. Um, there's a big uh, smelter where they used to mine gold back in the day in the gold rush time. So that's why the city was there. And smelter? Grew up there with my, yeah, gold mine. It was a gold mine that was the ski resort called Red Mountain. And then downtown is where they, they uh, what do you call it, smelted the gold or whatever. Oh, nice. And then, yeah, they called the city, they called it Trail because it was the trail between the mountain and the smelter. Okay. It's very unique. <laughs> so, grew up there, and um, yeah, blue collar town, man. You know, hardworking people. My family, my mom's side of the family, are all loggers, like lumberjacks from Canada, like the most Canadian thing there is. Legitimate lumberjacks cutting down trees. They're amazing. They have their own business. They're entrepreneurs their whole life. Um, build logging companies and things. You know. My dad's side of the family, my dad's a fireman. So, you know, when I was a kid, he was always taking me in the fire trucks, in the parades and and showing me, you know, what it means to work hard. You know, he would work hard four days on plus two days of overtime, come home, bust his ass in the garden, you know, shovel dirt, take me fishing. Um, just a hardworking family, you know, and I really grew up um, super fortunate. You know, just a, a great upbringing. I have my sister. Uh, she was a fair bit older, so she was out of the nest exploring the world and doing her thing. And um, yeah, it was it was the typical um, the typical blue collar family. And I was very supported in all the things I wanted to do. I was in different sports, and I, I traveled a lot with ski racing and things. And they supported me the whole way through. So just grateful, man. Yeah, you, you were a, a professional ski racer, right? I think that's what you've told me. Well, I mean, I was try try to be, okay. <laughs> you know, I was, I was working on it, right? So, yeah, I mean, I I moved up the ranks in ski racing back in the day when I was like 16, 17, 18, 19 were sort of like my my glory years when I was really on a trajectory. Okay. And then in my early 20s, I kind of plateaued and around 23 I was, you know, there's there's different levels in ski racing, right? There's like the Olympics, the World Cup guys, and then there's like a, a division underneath of that, and then there's a division underneath of that. And that's where I was hovering around for a few years. And it was great, man. I traveled the world. I met a lot of amazing people. I got a ton of, you know, um, uh, what do you call it? I got a ton of like discipline in me from it because you have to be disciplined to succeed in sport. Right. Okay. And so I learned a ton. It was awesome. And then at 23, I retired and I went down to the United States and I took a full ride scholarship to go ski for a university down there and party my way through school while skiing. That's interesting. So, so you said the, your your mom's side of the family was entrepreneurs, right? Entrepreneurial. They had their own business and stuff like that. Now, how did that impact you um, growing up? And then what does your relationship look like with your family now? Yeah, so growing up, my mom's side of the family, they were all loggers. So they had their own business. And I would go to my grandma's house or my uncle's houses, and I would see them. They would have their their skidders and their tractors and their logging trucks and all of their machinery and all the stuff around the house. And then they would go off at two or three in the morning and they would leave for three or four days. They would come back and they'd be up in the mountains, literally cutting down trees and harvesting forests and then come back and just, you know, tired and working hard. And it always inspired me because I knew that they were living life on their own terms. When they would come home after three or four days and we, I'd be there for the summer a lot of times and they had, there was a lake house. And so I would be there at the lake house, they'd come back and then they would say, oh, you know what? We're going to take three days off and we're just going to sit by the lake. We're going to go boating. You know, we're just going to enjoy the family. And then they would decide when they wanted to start a new project. And that always just got me pumped because I was like, that's cool what they're doing there. They're dictating their lifestyle, their schedule. They're spending time with their family when they want. And when they go off and work, they bust their ass and they work long and hard. And then they bring it back to the family. It was very inspiring. Um, I think that had a big impact on me growing up. I didn't really think about it until now, actually, but I think it did. That's interesting because, see, like, personally for me, uh, growing up, my father was a, a, an entrepreneur in Iraq, right? And that had a big impact on me personally 
watching him, like I used to admire him a ton, you know, watching him doing what he does. He used to always travel the world. Uh, at the time we had a clothing factory. He would travel the world and do his thing. And I always wanted to be like him. I wanted to be, but you know, the, the word entrepreneur, I feel like it just became sexy and popular over the last like decade or something like that. I don't know, at least for me, mm. I started hearing about it once I went online. For me, it was a businessman, you know, like I guess the, 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 the old days, the old school was like a businessman, you know, and I wanted to, to be a businessman like my dad. I wanted to own multiple businesses and that had an impact on me. And the reason why I wanted to talk about this topic, because I feel like oftentimes people um, wonder whether having someone or having some type of an impact on you growing up has something to do with you becoming an entrepreneur or not, you know, taking risks or not, because I'm pretty sure both of us have seen people where, you know, it's like they're just risk takers. It's like whatever they do, whatever, whatever they do in their lives, they're risk takers, whatever they do in life, whether they're going to become a doctor or a McDonald's employee or start the next, you know, software that's going to blow up, right? They are risk takers. And then there's the other people where they could have the biggest career that we've heard of. They could be a CEO of some company or something like that. And they're just very moderate. You know, they're very conservative, right? And so, like, I, I want to really kind of focus on this of, like, uh, like, how did that impact, you know, and, and you said that, you just kind of thought about it, but had you not seen that, do you believe that it could have been um, a, um, I guess you could have, like you would have gone in that entrepreneurial space? That's a really good question, man. Um, I, I think probably it impacted me subconsciously because I was little and I didn't really fully understand, you know, go to work, get a job, spend your time working for the man or work for yourself. I never, I never knew about that stuff. Um, so maybe subconsciously, but I think the thing that really impacted me the most as far as, you know, transitioning into the entrepreneurial space was when my wife and I had moved from Singapore where we were living for a few years, working in corporate hospitality. And that was like the most corporate thing I had ever done. I'd been in banks and insurance before, but the corporate hospitality world was super corporate. Like it was like, if you didn't say the right word, they were on your ass. And I hated that. So when we moved to consulting. I started working for myself as a consultant and then, you know, doing sweat equity into various businesses. And I realized then, oh, wait, I don't have to follow the mold. I can do my own thing. And that led me to, you know, eventually going online and that was sort of the transition. So there might've been a seed there from the logging family, but it was definitely, you know, 30 years later. So not sure. Got it. So then let's transition into, um, into now and, and what that relationship looks like and, and, and how, family can support someone to like take them to the next level or can hold them back. And the reason why for me personally, um, I know that my family has always been supportive of what I'm trying to do. I mean, you know, my dad pretty much gave me the last, uh, uh money they had for me to start my own business. Um, but then when it kind of went into like me wanting to, I guess, blossom and, and, and kind of become like my own man, the thing that I realized was the minute that I removed myself, like two, 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 two levels in my life that I had kind of like a, like an explosion in, in my, you know, career success, I guess you could say, is the minute that I got married and I moved out of my parents' house, because for us, you know, Middle Easterners, you literally have kids that are married and still living with their parents. They're like 40, 45, 50. I mean, my brother is like, almost 45. He's not married yet, but he still lives with my parents, you know? Uh, so I was living with my parents until I was 28 years old when I got married. But it was when I moved out of their house and I was now like my own man, you know, that I was responsible for another human is when I truly felt like an explosion in career. And then the second one was when I moved away from everything that I knew and I moved from California to Miami and that had an, an incredibly positive impact on me, on the business, on everything, because I felt like I was really removing myself from my comfort zone and I was kind of stepping away from my family because I love them and they're awesome. But I don't know if I would want to spend 365 days a, a year with them. You know, it's like, it's good to go back 
once uh once a quarter, once you know semi annually, and spend a week ten days with them. But it's like I gotta get out because sometimes the drama and stuff like that just kind of drains me. What kind of, I guess, what kind of um, experience do you have with family now at this level? Well, my family's always been super supportive uh, of everything I've I've chosen to do. So whether that was, you know, pursue ski racing full time and basically never go to high school, you know, not go to college right away, like be like, no, I want to be a professional athlete and I'm shooting for this, this dream of mine. And they were like, yep, go for that. Then when I went to school, it was like, Hey, I can get a full ride scholarship. I want to go to school and, you know, take a business degree or whatever. And they were like, yeah, go for that. Supportive, supportive the whole way through after school. Like I say, I've gone through so many different industries doing so many different things. I was working as a mortgage, uh, financial broker, uh, excuse me, a, a refinancer, whatever you call it. I can't remember in Wells Fargo. And then I was an insurance salesman and then I was in hospitality and now I'm working online. Every single move of the way, my parents, my sister, anyone who talked to me about anything, they were just like, oh, that's, that's very cool. How's it going? Going well? Cool. Keep going. So I never had anyone telling me like, maybe you should do this. Maybe you should do that. Everyone was just supportive of my ideas along the way. Now, I know that's definitely not the story for everybody. Um, I know a lot of my friends and things have taken certain paths and their parents are sort of pushing them back and sort of forcing them into different roles and what they want them to do. I never had that. My parents were always just like, whatever you want to do, that's awesome. We got your back on it. And that's still true today. I'm online. They have no fucking clue what I do. I, I explain it every so often and they're like, whatever, as long as you're happy and you, 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 your wife is happy, you guys are good. You got, you got some good money and everything's cool and like you're sorted and you're healthy. Yep. You're good. Right. That, that, that's it. So very supportive, very supportive. I'm super grateful for that. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Uh, one thing that I notice with a lot of our students, especially at BJK University, is that like what he just said right now about uh, their families forcing them into something. <clears throat> I remember the early days where I'd be talking to people. They'd be like, yeah, you know, I'm trying to go to school and get this degree, but then I'm also trying to start my own business. And this is why I want to, you know, get on Amazon. And my question would always be like, well, why are you going to school? Like, do you do you eventually want to become an entrepreneur or is this kind of to pay for this or what's happening here? And the answer would always be like, no, I'm doing it because my family wants me to become an engineer or have a degree. It's kind of like that, that cushion to fall back on, you know? And my mindset has always been like, if you're going to do something for someone else, like, especially to try to like, you know, to try to, um, I guess to, to, to make your parents proud, you're just going to be miserable. Five, ten years down the line, you're going to wake up and realize that you're living someone else's dream. And I almost went in that path because my mom sold me on the fact that I should become a doctor. And for like two, three years, I was going to school, I was studying, I was doing all that to become a doctor. And I realized one day, like, two, that's not the kind of life I want to live. And for about a year, I had dropped out of school. She did not know. Right. I was like, or in the business and stuff like that. And it was just so difficult for me to tell her because I was like, I'm going to destroy her, you know, literally until a couple of years ago, she stopped telling me, I know one day you're going to go back to school and become a doctor, you know? And I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm making a month more than what they make in like years, you know? And, um, yeah. so I think it's dangerous to like really, the fact that you had support a family that's great but i think not a lot of people have that out there and it's very important to you know select the right path that fulfills you personally and not what fulfills someone else's dream you know what i mean oh 100 percent. there's no doubt about that you know um i i have had support along the way and i'm super again grateful for it but even if i didn't have support i would definitely be uh, hoping that I would make the decision to fulfill my own destiny, right? Because at the end of the day, you know, people can have an idea of what they want for themselves or for other people or for whoever, but it's like, it's your life, right? So like, if you're sitting at home watching us right now and someone's telling you to go do the thing because they want to do the thing and they didn't do it. And you're sitting there being like, I don't want to do that shit. You have to choose what you want to do. Right. And again, we talk about this all the time. What do you value? What are the things you value in life and what are the outcomes you want for you and your family? 
focus on those things and find a path to get there that you enjoy doing and that you can get good at doing for a long period of time. If you can do that shit, you'll get where you want to go. You'll be in line with your values and you'll give your family the life they deserve. Other people imposing their thoughts and beliefs onto you is just them projecting out some, you know, something that they haven't fulfilled or, or some uh, belief they have inside them about themselves that they're projecting onto you. You need to be strong enough to realize I'm here for me. I need to figure out what I want to do. And you need to be strong enough to have the courage to do it. And again, the, the best way to do that is with a community around you of people who are in the same boat, right? We have like thousands of students who are in the position of other people think I should do this, but I want to do this. And we're like, if you want to do it, we got your back. You need that support system around you to do it. Have, have you had support people around you? Like when you, when you decided not to be a doctor and you decided to go online, how did you make that transition? Were you alone? How did you, how did you do that switch? First I was alone and I failed. You know, when I started my hmm. restaurant, because that was kind of the first business after I, I broke away from being a doctor, um, I did try to attempt it alone, you know, although I had, you know, I had employees and stuff like that, but I was still operating from a place of like the, the, the genius with a thousand helpers. And that just did not work. And then when I went online, the first, you know, the first attempt, I also did it alone and, uh, and that didn't work out. Um, but it wasn't until I surrounded myself with, with the right people. And again, at that level, I needed the people that I would hang out with every day, the people that I would like, um, I guess, uh, 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 um, spend the most time with every day needed to be on that trajectory and needed to be speaking different language because at the time, whenever I would hang out with my, with my family or with my parents or whatever, they're talking about, you know, uh, uh, the news and they're talking about the war in Iraq and they're talking about this and they're talking about that. Everything out there that we cannot control and not focusing at anything here that we can't actually control and do anything about. Whenever I hang out with my friends on their days off, we're, you know, going to a hookah lounge or we're, you know, we're uh, 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 playing video games or whatever. And then I kind of started looking at my life thinking, if I want to do this, and I'm hanging out with people that have that have no interest in going there. How exactly am I going to make that happen? And this is where I like I made the intention move of removing myself from that cohort of people and of placing myself in a completely different cohort and a place where people are striving to to achieve great things in life. And great things in life doesn't always need to be in finances, regardless what anyone is trying to do, it's very important to surround yourself with the right people that are all thriving to become successful in that area. This is why our community at BJK University is an incredible place for anyone wanting to start a business because you've got nearly 6,000 people rallying around you to do this thing. Yeah. So... <laughs> You said a lot of shit there. I kind of want to go over to, uh, like, what if there's people watching right now? Or what if someone out there is thinking to themselves, Aaron just said he went to school, right? Bashar said he started going to school. People are telling me I should go to school, right? Like college has been this thing for how many years now, right? It's like, Go to school, learn a degree, get a job. If someone's forcing them to do that, is that the right move? Or should we just say like, what is school? You know, is there a difference between online and offline? Why do fucking offline school, uh, like why do universities, why will they give you a fucking loan to go to school that you have to pay back and that they won't give you a fucking loan to do a business? Your 20 year old kid. Like, what's that shit all about? What's your opinion on school, man? So, uh, people will, regardless who you are, regardless where you live, people will always want higher skills or they will always want a better life, right? It doesn't matter what you're doing. Even if you're making a million dollars a day, you still want a better life. You still want to improve whatever it is you're doing. If you live in India or if you live in America, if you live... 
in in Iraq or if you live in Canada, right? You always are thriving for a better life. And for in order for you to better your life, you need a higher level of skills. Until now, the traditional school system has had a monopoly on providing skills, and that is the safe route of go to school, get a degree, get a job, retire at 65, and that 25 to 45 years of working, you're contributing towards your 401k. Hopefully, you don't live beyond 80, 85. Otherwise, your 401k will probably run out, and then you're fucked, right? So... That's kind of really the that's really the 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 traditional system that has been built. Mm. But over the last couple decades, there has been new ways. People are becoming aware that there are new ways. And this is where, you know, programs uh, like we offer come into place. But to go back to why they make it normal and it's okay for you to get a loan to start a, uh, to go to school and get a job, but not get a loan to start a business is a great fucking question. Because that's the thing that I'm always yeah. telling people. It's like, dude, you, like, you will get a fucking credit card. They will give you a credit card so you can go and buy a Louis bag or buy, you know, go to dinner and spend money on, on shit that you can't probably afford, Right? But then they won't give you a loan yeah. to start a fucking business that could produce cash flow, which you can you, you can employ yeah. people, you can improve other people's lives, you can improve your life, you could do all that stuff. So yeah, it is it is definitely a fucked system and it's rigged against people, in my opinion. Oh fuck, is it ever, dude? Um, you know where I realized that the system's rigged? I realized it when I was refinancing mortgages for Wells Fargo. So straight out of college, the first job I had was during the financial recession when the housing market crashed in like 08, 09, 2010, like around there. Yeah. Okay, that's when I graduated my, my business degree in the States. And I got to work in the States for a year on a green card. And I was like, oh, fuck, I'm going to go work at the bank because like I'm brainwashed by school. I think that's where I need to go. And I just have this vision of like, you know, if you guys seen the, the, the show, The Suits or Billions or any of these like HBO shows, it's like, dude, I'm going to be that guy, right? It's like the second I walk into that bank, for sure, I'm going to be the CEO like the day I get there. And I'm going to have like a $10,000 suit on and a Rolex and I'm going to roll up in a fucking Benz. For sure, that's what's going to happen the first day. Like that's how school got me fucking thinking. I'm serious. And I got there and I was like in a warehouse with papers stacked around me and we were refinancing loans for people for their mortgages. But the direction that the bank was giving us was deny. I was like, wait a minute. These people are coming to us because they need to refinance because the fucking market crashed and they're fucked. Their families are fucked. They're getting kicked out of their house. Everything's terrible for them right now. They're coming to us for help. We're a bank. We're the people who gave them the loan to start with. We wrote them the shitty loan. Okay. They come to us and they're like, Hey, excuse me, Mr. Bank. Can you guys help us like fix this loan agreement? Because it's hard to make this payment right now. Can we get a bit of lenience here? Spread it out a little bit, play with it a bit. And the direction the bank gave us was deny everybody unless it's like the perfect application. And even then it has to go to upper management to get cleared. When they told us that in this giant warehouse, I was like, what the fuck is going on right now? We're not here to help anybody. We're screwing them over. And that's when I realized the banking system was completely rigged and fucking jacked against the person. So I quit. I didn't work there anymore. And to go further into the school analogy, when I was at school, I was lucky enough to be on a scholarship. I have tons of friends that were paying out their ass to go to that school, right? It's a great school. It's an amazing school. It's a long institution. It's, it's a very well-established place. Yeah, I had a great experience. The teachers were nice. It's all good. But people were paying tens of thousands of dollars a semester. And now they have this loan to pay off at the end. Then they go get a job that pays them almost nothing. I just, I couldn't put the pieces together. You know what I mean? That's why I moved out and I was like, dude, I'm leaving like North America thinking maybe Singapore or Asia or something would be a different corporate space. Come to find out it's even more ruthless over there. <laughs> well, see, the thing yeah. is, is that that's promoted to be the safe way, right? And then yeah, I had not. people 20 years later trying to still pay off the same fucking loan that they got 20 fucking years ago that got them the shitty job that they now hate, right? 
and working for probably some, you know, worthless piece of shit that doesn't give a shit that tells them deny every single fucking application because we're really not here to help people. We're here to screw them over, right? And that's the thing that um, that boggles my mind because, like, when I hear people saying, well, I'm going to school because, you know, I want to have a safety net. I want to have something to fall back on. It's like, dude, you're fucking yourself right now. Yeah. And you just don't realize it. Hard. But it's like... Yeah. Society has injected in our brain for decades now that it's okay to bend backwards and go get a loan or spend tens of thousands of dollars on a degree that is pretty fucking useless. I was hanging out with a friend um, uh, a couple of nights ago, and he's just paying for his sister, who he brought her from Turkey to here. That's where they live. And he just paid 40 grand for her to learn to learn marketing, to get a, a, a marketing degree. And I'm just looking at him, I'm like, dude, do you have almost a million followers on Instagram. You've got an incredible marketing team in-house. Bring her to your fucking marketing team and teach her this shit, you know? <laughs> like, there is, there's thousand, two thousand, five thousand dollar courses out there that she can take and learn in 30 days more than she can in four years of college. Shit that's actually fucking relevant today, not stuff that was relevant 35 years ago. You know? 100%. Uh... I think Julius Caesar said something about experience is the teacher of everything. Yes. So it's like this chick is going to school now where she could just jump into your buddy's business and just jump in the trenches. You know, how many people have we seen come into the, the student body who's never been an entrepreneur, never been online. I remember back in the day, there was a guy that you helped him set up his computer. Remember that? Yeah. Like you help them log in and like, well, how does the Windows start? And it's like, you know, install this driver and like back. Remember that? Like we got people like that <laughs> starting businesses and succeeding. Meanwhile, it's like, no, no, you got to go for four fucking years of your life and keep going to these classes and stuff. Again, I enjoyed school. Okay. But I wasn't there to learn. I was there to enjoy myself. That's what I did. Partied, had fun, great experiences. Did I learn anything? Very fucking little. Very little. I didn't do any homework. I didn't read the books. And I think I'm a normal case in college. Like, I think I'm a normal, we all did that. You know what I mean? So I, I think with technology now, there's so many different avenues people can take. Again, if you're a doctor, a lawyer, this kind of stuff, of course, you need to go to school and get certain degrees. But if you're looking to, you know, have time freedom, work on your own time schedule, create the business lifestyle that you want, maybe get into something that you enjoy more than just something you have to do. There's other ways, you know, and I just, I think the, the, the self-taught or better yet taught through a community or a program, that's obviously the future. Like, do you know any kids nowadays, like TikTok, think of like a 15 year old kid on TikTok right now. Like, are they thinking like, oh man, I can't wait to go to university. <laughs> no, they're thinking, how can I monetize my 300 followers? Right. How can I launch this little product thingy majigger and do something like that's what they're thinking. That's clearly the future. So. It's like the old dudes like us that need to like wake up out there and see it. Like we're kind of in the middle. You know what I mean? At least me, I'm 42, right? I see myself in the middle. Like guys my age and slightly older, it's like right there are the group of people where it's like, ah, that fucking internet's for kids and, you know, get a, get a job or whatever. And then there's like the people younger than me that are like, none of them want to get a job. Then there's the younger, younger generation that just definitely don't want to get a job ever, right? They're so entitled, it's ridiculous. And then there's like us in the middle. And I feel like we can see both sides quite well. It's interesting. So let's pivot to one thing real quick. We talked about um, how how business can can help people. So the bank clearly wasn't helping people. It fucked everybody over. And when they want to refinance, it fucked them again twice. That will fuck. Okay. So let's talk about how businesses can actually be responsible for creating, you know, socially sustainable communities and, um, like take responsibility and ownership for helping society be a better place. Businesses can do that. Business owners can do that. Talk to us about the foundation. Yeah. Well, uh, the, I mean, just last year alone, um, uh, we put in about 150 K, uh, in the foundation that we're going to deploy, uh, you know, this year. To, uh, to to help, I mean, I like to 
be a like if I'm gonna help someone, I want to be able to like feel it, touch it, see it, be involved in it. You know, now maybe when when I'm worth billions of dollars and then there are like hundreds of millions of dollars that I'm gonna be donating. You know, at that point, it's like, well, hey, at that scale, I'm just gonna write checks and you know. But right now, like, remember last year when we did our event in Miami in, in October, September, October, we went to this church yeah. where there were, you know, a bunch of um, homeless people that came in and, uh, you know, we, we helped feed them, we helped clothe them. Uh, there were like, there was like a barber there and stuff like that. We donated to that church and to that function. And so that lady that actually put that function for us lives literally down the street from me. And, uh, and, and it's funny because literally two days ago, I connected her with Rueda, my wife. To kind of see like what programs they have coming up because she's very involved in the in the in society and like the the local community to help people in need in the city here in Miami, and um, mm. like a hundred fifty thousand dollars I donated to charity last year. Five seven years ago, I didn't even make that a year. I didn't even generate that as an income for me personally. Now I'm donating that per year, right? And this was year one, uh, you know, this year I, I planned on, 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 you know, definitely increasing that, hopefully doubling it at least. But the thing that a lot of times, uh, you know, like Amazon uh, uh, is usually in the gutter all the time. People talking shit about how Amazon is like, you know, uh, uh, killing a whole bunch of jobs and how Walmart came into this town and destroyed all these, you know, all these local businesses and stuff like that. Literally right before we get on here and record, I um, I watched this short uh, clip on Grant Cardo's channel. He had his uh, 10x growth con here pretty recently. And uh, this lady that came on there is in robotics. And she was talking about how Amazon has 500,000 robots in their warehouses. But also, yeah. although they have 500,000 robots... They have employed 1.5 million fucking people. One company <laughs> has employed 1.5 million people. Now, these are not fucking $9 an hour fucking jobs. I mean, I don't know what the minimum wage at, uh, at uh, Amazon is, but I think it's well in the 15, 16, 17, 18 dollars an hour, right? And yes, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're warehouse jobs and shit like that. And like, you know, 3,500 people fucking just protested because Amazon is like asking them to come back to work. In office, four days of fucking week, and they're going crazy. And it's like, what the fuck out of yeah. world are we living in, right? They employ 1.5 yeah. million people. So should Amazon not have been there, that's 1.5 million jobs just fucking gone. How many jobs are we creating? Right now we have, what, 50 people at BJK University? All the people that, yeah. we, are, yeah. that we are contracted with, all of their businesses, all the businesses we're creating... All those would not have happened should a business not have been created, which is Amazon, you know? Totally. Social responsibility, man. You know, you, you can't go save the world and shit. If, number one, you don't have the funds to do it or the time to do it or the capacity to do it, right? I can tell you when I was working corporate, I didn't have the capacity, the funds, or any sort of bandwidth to do it. It wasn't even on my fucking radar at all. What was on my radar in corporate back in the day? Banking, insurancing, and hotels. Staying alive in the grind. It's like the commute's going to suck today. My boss is on my ass about this thing I don't care about. Fucking bullshit. My paycheck's small. That, that, that was on my mind. You know? We moved to Southeast Asia, started consulting for hotels and like building our own entrepreneurial stuff. Immediately, my brain was like, oh, I wonder how we contribute and do things like this. So one of the things we did over there uh, the consulting company that I managed, we had a program called Helping Hands. And this was a program that um, myself and the co-founder put together. And we would take linens and bed sheets and things from the various hotels we ran and other hotels. And we would distribute it out to the local tribes, right? The, the Ati community, they were called. So we would distribute these out. So we'd help them with like their bedding and stuff. We would go to their communities and fund building them shacks, houses out of, you know, concrete, floor with grass, native structure, um, building shacks, putting in sewers, toilets, and teaching them how to be entrepreneurs themselves so that they can have gift shops and sell like little bracelets and things to the tourists on the beach. Nice. We would literally teach them like, hey, if you build this little bracelet, it'll cost you like a peso for all the material. You can sell it to the tourist on the beach for, you know, 
five pesos. That means you'll make four. If you give one to the person who got the material, you give one to the boy who ran to the beach to sell it, that gives you two. And now three of you have made some money. So we were teaching them this stuff and it was called helping hands. And, you know, I could have never done that stuff back then. You could never do the foundation with BJKU in Miami. That was so awesome when we went there. If we weren't living life on our own terms, had the time to do it, had the bandwidth to do it, had the money to do it. And all of a sudden you have different desires sparking from your soul when you're not in this fucking grind every day of the nine to five. The nine to five sucks your soul from you. When you're, when you're out of that nine to five soul sucking shit and you, you open up your own light and you expand yourself, when that happens, you start seeing around the world where you can add value, solve problems and help people with various things. And foundations and charities is a fucking huge part of that. Huge. I'm super excited about the future of BJKU's fund, man. It's very exciting stuff. Absolutely. And one thing that I, uh, <clears throat> that I want to make very clear to everyone watching is, look, let's face it, not everyone is going to become an entrepreneur. Uh, probably not everyone watching this. And although people watching this are the 1% that the, the crazy ones that want to be an entrepreneur, but s some of you may not become an entrepreneur, you know, and that's okay. But if you are going to work for someone or if you are going to be part of something, make sure that that something actually is on a mission to do something, actually contributes to society, actually is part of the change in the world that we are talking about here, you know? Because, like, when you look at it, you know, not everyone is going to build the next BJK University or the next, you know, the next Amazon or the next Walmart or the next whatever, you know? And and there are, like, 31 million small businesses in America alone, 25 million of them break even or lose money and have one fucking person, just one person. It's just a single fucking entrepreneur, right? And so yeah. that's noble. Like, if that that's what you want to build, that's noble. But also you could be part of something else. And, and like, something else doesn't necessarily mean, you know, being part of another company, being part of another business. But also if you think about it, Whenever we think of like starting a business, we always think about, I want to go start my own thing. I want to like figure this shit out. I want to start something from complete scratch. Like for me, it was like a restaurant. Yeah, I'm going to fucking go open a restaurant. Who are I? Let's do it, you know? But it's like, what if you became part of someone else's business? What if you tapped into someone else's business? And what I mean by this is, is like platforms like Amazon, because when you are becoming an Amazon seller, you're... I guess you could look at it and say, I am an entrepreneur, but you're not completely starting everything from scratch. You're not creating your own ecosystem. Whenever I went to my restaurant business, I needed to create an ecosystem. I needed to drive traffic. I needed to find employees that work for me. I needed to fucking find vendors that supported everything for me. Although you technically need to do a lot of this stuff with Amazon, but not really. Because Amazon is taking care of your fulfillment. You know, they've built these fucking massive warehouses that are like, each one is the size of a of, of like nine or ten football fields. I mean, it's insane, right? They've created all that stuff. For, they've created the foundation. They've created the infrastructure. They store your fucking inventory for you. They fulfill the product for you. You know, you're literally just bringing in your shit and plugging into their system and then turning it on and then moving. And instead of you going out there and like building your own little thing that you don't know where the fuck is going to go. Yeah. Dude, it's it's so true. Um, <laughs> when I uh, when I first learned about what you can do on Amazon, I was like, oh my god, people are doing that. I always thought it was Amazon selling Amazon stuff. Mm. Like it did. I was like, that's Amazon.com. They have a website where they sell some stuff. I didn't realize it was just regular people going on there and leveraging the system and jumping on the coattails, right? And so I explained it to my wife and her, her family, her brother. And I was like, did you know that like you can get on the other side of the Amazon coin? You don't just have to spend money on Amazon. You can actually sell and make money on Amazon. They were like, what the fuck are you talking about? And I showed them what's up. And my, my wife and her brother built a store together. You know, obviously following BJKU's method. It's awesome. But it's like, people just don't know. I was one of them. They were one of them, right? But yeah, tapping into an existing infrastructure... A lot of times I ask our students, you know, like, what was it about Amazon? Like, why did you choose this as your vehicle? I mean, there's 
literally thousands of ways that you can go out and make a side hustle or make extra money or, you know, escape your job or whatever it may be, or diversify your portfolio. There's millions of ways to do it. Why did you choose Amazon? And like nine out of 10 times when I talk to someone on the phone and ask that question, they say, well, it's like the biggest company in the world. Kind of makes sense. Mm. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> it really does. You know, it really, really does. Yeah. So let me ask you, man, um, you talked about the restaurant. Uh, I've been talking about consulting. Now we're online doing our thing. Let's talk about some lessons we've learned because I'm sure people listening are like, what are some do's and don'ts or what shouldn't I do? What should I avoid? What should I double down on? Maybe they want to leave their job. Maybe they want to transition full-time online. Maybe they want a side hustle. Maybe they want to diversify their portfolio. Maybe they want to leave the corporate grind, right? What are some of the lessons that you've picked up along the way? Probably there is uh, 10,695 lessons that I've picked up. <laughs> yeah. How many hours do you have? <laughs> oh, dude. Yeah. Holy shit. I, I literally was very tempted right now to grab my phone because I have like for every section of, of something I create like lessons learned and principles and, and that kind of stuff. And they're usually like one-liners, like one-liners that I just yeah. like, you know, stand by. So here's a one-liner. Uh, this is something that I told you yesterday when we were talking. And it's uh, never take advice uh, uh, horizontally, always take advice vertically. And what that means is always find someone who is way ahead of you to take advice from them because I've made the mistake of taking something from someone when it was working for them that is, you know, at or right around my level uh, whether if that's in sales, marketing, whatever it is, right? And I am implemented in my business. And then, you know, six months later, I'm like, well, fuck, why is this not working? I go back to them and they're like, yeah, well, it worked for me for like three days and then it stopped working. But they got so excited about it. They told the world about it. And then they looked like the, 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 the fucking the hot shot for a moment. And then it failed. But then when you, like, when I, um, uh, when I'm, Helping, for example, I, the same guy that I was telling you about how his sister is uh, trying to learn uh, graphic design and stuff like that. Um, he's probably, like his business is probably the 10th, you know, 10th of the size of BJK University. <clears throat> and I literally said, like, over the last year and a half, we would hang out maybe once a quarter, like for dinner, lunch, whatever, coffee or something like that. And we'll spend an hour. And then, you know, we'll be talking, like, in conversation. I, like, it's not even intentional that I'm trying to coach him. In conversation, he would ask questions, I would respond. His business has 8 x in the last about 14 months from me unintentionally coaching him. Uh, yeah. Because, again, his bit like, I'm so far ahead of him where it's like, I've seen the cycles, I've seen all this stuff where I can literally just look at his business break it apart, give him one, two things, and then it can exponentially explode his business. And so this is why it's very important for you that that's watching. If you're learning, you know, if you wanted to, to, to learn how to sell on Amazon, or if you want to start a business, you want to start investing, if you want to get into real estate, if you want to, you know, lose 10 pounds or whatever, find someone that's so far ahead of you that it's like there's no doubt in your mind that this person is just testing this thing and maybe it's working, maybe it's not, and you're kind of like, taking uh, some parts of it. Yeah, that's a really good one, dude. That's a really good one. Um, the, the, the power of mentorship and coaching is uh, it's something you can't even put a price on. And like you said, a lot of times it comes in conversations, but I mean, it sounds to me like whoever that gentleman is, he's asking the right fucking questions, isn't he? Yes. Right. So, so that's, that's something that I've definitely picked up over the years. You want to be, um, you know, we go to these masterminds and we go to these community events all the time, right. With people in our industry. And when we go there, I, I always tell myself, because I can talk, I don't know if you've noticed, I can talk, right. I can just run my mouth for fucking hours about things I'm passionate about. But when I go to these events, like I intentionally like have a mantra playing in my mind the entire time. It's like, Two years, one mouth. Two years, one mouth. Two years, one mouth. I'm just telling myself, like, shut the fuck up. Ask questions. Ask questions. Listen, listen, and listen. And um, the value you get from just being a fly on the wall, if you're in the right room, right? Like, if you go to our our community and you go into the the section where they're talking about, 
you know, product research or whatever it may be. You don't have to ask a question or, or contribute in there. You can just scroll and you're like, oh shit, that guy's six months ahead of me. Oh shit, that guy's launching his fourth product. Well, what did he say there about that thing? Oh, that's interesting. And you just pick these little pieces and start putting the puzzle together for yourself. And again, progress equals happiness. So you just go, you pick a piece here, you pick a piece there, you put your pieces together for yourself. You're like, oh, you know what? I just figured out my next couple of moves. I'm going to go to the live coaching session today, get it validated from one of the coaches. Then I'm going to go do my work. And I just made some amazing progress later at dinner that night. You know, you're going to sit down with your, your partner, your significant other, your friends, your family, whatever, your kids. And you're going to be like, oh man, I made some great progress today. I learned this thing from this guy and I did it. Right. And that's the power of having people around you and actually having two ears and one mouth, right. Versus just and trying to like put shit out there for no reason. Right. What about this, man? What about this? A lot of people start businesses and, or they go into projects or things. Amazon is an example. I have lots of examples. Um, you go into things and you feel like maybe you bit off more than you can chew. And so possibly you start self-sabotaging. You have self-doubt. Have you ever been in a position where you help someone through self-doubt or you've seen someone who is in a position of self-doubt or maybe yourself where you had to double down on belief to get through it? And where did that come from? Um, <clears throat> so for me, I learned, uh, recently I learned a, a, an exercise, uh, and I call it the certainty exercise. Every single one of us here, um, has gone through a, a, a situation where <clears throat> at some point, whatever the, the goal was or whatever we were trying to accomplish seemed like out of reach, like way out of reach, like no fucking way. There's no way I'm going to accomplish this. Somehow with brute force, with, you know, incredible amounts of, of tenacity of just like force and you just kept on, you know, grind, whatever it is, motivation, you cracked through and you made it to the other side. Right. And so what I try to do every time I have those, you know, negative talk, negative self-talk or belief or whatever it is, this belief is I try to bring up a situation where I once couldn't, did not believe that I, I, I could accomplish the result that I was trying to accomplish and made it happen. And then just think about that. And I'm like, okay, at some point in my life, I thought this wasn't possible, but I made it possible. What can I learn from that? What did I do differently that I would do normally that I can take and apply in this position, in this situation, and also overcome these obstacles, these disbeliefs. Because at the end of the day, the only thing that's holding you back is you, and it's 80% psychology. So it's all in your mind, right? It's literally all in your mind. If you can learn how to not manipulate, but influence your mind and be, um, be aware of everything that you say to yourself, everything that you put out there in the world, everything that you uh, you say and do, and be very selective about what you say and do, then literally anything that you're trying to accomplish will happen eventually. Now, one thing that I have learned, and I want to uh, hear your thoughts about this, is input. Because this is also another... I mean, the, one of the most valuable lessons that I've learned over the last few years is how much input that I take on and how much action I do in certain, in, in like how many different areas, right? And like staying focused, staying disciplined. What is an experience or what is, uh, I guess, something that you can share about how less could be a lot of times more? <laughs> Well, I mean, I got to give a lot of credit to you for this one. Um, when we met, I had, you know, 10,000 apps on my phone. I had 10,000 affiliate marketing offers, MLM things. So I was trying to figure out the internet. And um, you introduced the, the, the term focus to me, right? Focus. Trademarked, right? And I was like, it's interesting. And so over time, I started removing things from my life. I started removing, 
uh, the inputs I took in, I unfollowed like a gajillion people on social media. I eventually deleted social media, right? Like, it's funny because we're all over social media with our stuff, but we're not actually on social media, right? Like we don't have it on our phones and stuff, but because you don't want the input, you don't follow anybody. You, you're a producer, you're not a consumer. Um, and over time now, you know, it, I got to a point where I like deleted every single email I've ever had in my life. I deleted every message in all Facebooks and Instagrams and, and, and text messages. Like I have zero inboxes in all of anything that I own now. And it just became so light for me, um, that I just feel like I have more capacity to think and innovate and create in the space that matters. And that's usually around health, wealth, family contribution, and of course, business, right? Um, uh, a, a big place where less has been more for me has been, I used to be obsessed with like reading a lot. You know, I used to rip through a book, a couple of books a month almost, right? Like every two or three weeks I'd finish a book and I would just pile them up. Now I've found that I've slowed down on reading and I've, I've read, I read slower. Um, I also listen to the audio book in the car or whatever, or in, in, in my headphones at the gym and stuff. And I write notes and I journal about what I'm, what I'm learning and thinking. And I go back and I reread things. I underline stuff. I highlight stuff. I, I, you know, dog nerd, what do you call it? Corner the pages. I kind of treat it like a workbook versus just ripping through it. So I think less is more has been a huge lesson for me in a lot of ways. And, uh, in our house and stuff now, much like your house, we're quite minimal, not quite as minimal as you. I think that's impossible for us, but we're, we're close, <laughs> you know, we don't have a ton of stuff. Um, but, uh, yeah, less, less is more. The thing is the part that you do let allow into your life needs to be super fucking high quality. Right. So if you get in a mastermind, you get in a community, you get in a program, you decide you're going to do a certain workout, a certain diet. It's like stick to that shit, but make sure that's the best fucking shit there is. Right. So if I follow a guy who's telling me what supplements to take, right, I will find the best guy who's vetted that I know is good, that has tons of recommendations from people I respect. And I will get that guy's advice. I will take it and I'll just cancel everybody else. Yes. And I love that because this, uh, when people ask me, where should I start? I always tell them, go into what I call a discovery phase. And a discovery phase is taking two, three, four, five, six months, whatever long you need <clears throat> to figure out what it is that you're trying to do, right? And this, uh, this could be anything and everything. As you said, this could be in health, this could be in relationships, this could be, you know, uh, business could be anything, but for the sake of this example, let's just take business. And for example, you're trying to start an online business. I would literally go on there and find three to five things that you are interested in. This could be, you know, affiliate marketing, Amazon FBA, drop shipping, crypto, uh, and, and real estate arbitrage, for example, right? Take those five things and then find two to three people in each one of those three, you know, three to five things that you're trying to learn that you, you potentially could learn from. That you see yourself that you would resonate with this person, you can learn from them. And then follow each one of those people for a month, two months, three months. And then at the end, you want to drop literally all the other four things and focus on one. And in that one thing, you're listening to two or three people. And then after another month or two, you drop everyone else and you just listen to one person. And then you go deep. Like as you said about the book, you want to go deep. You don't want to go horizontally, you want to go vertical into someone's teachings and learn everything. Like for me over the last year, it's been Tony Robbins. And Tony Robbins is so three-dimensional that it's like there's so much I can learn from him, right? Previous to that was Sam Ovens. And I just went deep into Sam Ovens, right? And so it's very important to go deep into one person or one topic or, or whatever it is and then learn everything and anything there is about that thing. And then usually what you're going to realize is that any one person or one thing, whether if it's a business or a, 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 a vertical or a, uh, a mentor or whatever, they're only going to get you usually to a certain level. And then from there, you're just going to have to graduate to the next thing, to the next person or the next program or the next whatever, right? Uh, just like with, uh, uh, you know, with our program, it's like, well, first we help them, we help students launch their first product you know, and then uh, kind of build a brand around that. And then from there, they graduate to our next level program, which is now let's help you build a full-on brand, multiple products, 
And then the next thing we're working on as well is like, well, how do you build this product to exit? You know, three, four, five X your net profits and then exit from there, you know? And so there's always going to be, you want to go vertically into one thing, take it as deep as possible and then get to a level and then you want to graduate to the next thing. Yeah. And, and, you know, the only source of knowledge is experience, right? Yes. Einstein must be right if he said it, but it's like that experience doesn't need to be yours. It can be other people's experience. 100%. Right? So getting the right people around you, going deep, and then just getting past your fears and your doubts and diving in yourself. It's like, how do you get started? You jump in the fucking water and start drowning and you learn to swim ASAP. You know, I, I, I say an analogy all the time, um, entrepreneurship, it's kind of like coming to the edge of a, a cliff. So you're an entrepreneur, you want to start a business. You come to the edge of a cliff and you have like nails and you have wood and some duct tape and some, some metal with you and you're an entrepreneur and what you need to do is take a leap of faith. Right? You know that your goals and your, your, your life's ambitions are on the other mountain. You need to get there. The only way to get there is to fly. So what are you going to do? You're going to throw all this stuff off the edge of the cliff. You're going to jump. You're going to trust yourself on the way down and your learnings that you learn from your teacher, your mentor, and you're going to build an airplane as you fall and you're going to fly away before you hit the ground. Right? So the only way you're going to be able to build a plane that quickly while you're flying through the air is if you've gone deep on learning how to build a plane from someone who's done it before you, you remembered it, you took the steps and you do that shit and you just jump. If you don't jump, you'll never know. Right. But if you don't go deep and you do jump, you're fucked. Does that make sense? And I use that all the time when I'm talking to people. And for me, it really, it hits home because it's true. Um, let me ask you this, man. I want to go somewhere completely different because you said Tony Robbins and we all love Tony. Um, he says that the human body is, 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 um, I was listening to his podcast the other day. He said, human body is a, a, a picture of the soul. So what you're on the outside is manifesting from your soul. It's interesting, right? So when we're talking about success, I know that you have certain pillars of success. I do as well. Um, let's talk about what does success mean to you? And let's start with health because I know you're on a health trip. Um, since your seizure, I know you follow Tony and you do a bunch of cool stuff. What does success look like for you? And, and is health a big part of that? And, and if so, why? So if you asked me this question exactly a year ago, I would have told you that first of all, I'm not successful. Uh, secondly, success means how much money you have in the bank. Um, how, um, how big of a thing you've built. And usually that thing is a business, right? Today I have five pillars of success and that's health, gratitude and contribution, wealth, relationships, right? And, um, and then the other thing is that, that I noticed as of May of last year, is that I thought I was living a healthy lifestyle. I thought I was living a a great life. I thought everything was going perfectly fine until I had a seizure out of nowhere. In the at the time and the best time of my life, like I was literally at like at the highest levels that I could be in any area of life according to my knowledge and and, and what I knew at the time, right? Yeah. But then when I looked at my, like when I started looking at my health and I started looking into it like very deeply and, and very closely, I realized that I really wasn't optimizing my health. I really wasn't prioritizing my health and I really wasn't prioritizing any other area of my life outside of financial success. And it's funny because although over the last 12 years I had only prioritized financial success, I still did not feel successful. Like when people said, are you successful? I'm like, well, fuck, it depends on what you mean by successful, but I don't feel successful. And that actually started kind of coming out for me because after my seizure, I started seeing a therapist and uh, she likes to call herself a coach, but she's my fucking therapist. And, uh, and, and you know, and, um, 
And like the one of the first exercises we did is like, you know, she was asking me, and she would always be telling me, you know, you're so successful, you've, you know, figured out this money thing, blah, blah. And one day I'm like, can you stop fucking tell, saying that I'm successful? She's like, why? Well, because I don't feel successful. She's like, that's interesting. Well, let's compare yeah. you to, you know, to the 99.9% of population of the planet Earth. And then I started, like, going through that, and I was like, holy fuck. It's like humankind, we're always focused on the negative. We're always focused on what we don't have. We're always focused on the bad. And there's so much good that we could be focused on, but we don't really pay attention to that. Mm. Dude, spot on, man. What you focus on expands too, right? Yeah. So if you're focusing on the negative and you're living in this 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 space where you have anxiety and, and fears and and guilt, because you're focusing on the negative, it could be past traumas, it could be future unknowns. If you're focusing on that shit, you're just gonna manifest that in your health, right? And so for me, I also went through a health crisis very similar to yours. Oh, we've never even really talked about this, but I also had um, seizures of sorts. Uh, I don't know what they were, but like same sort of idea, you know, collapse on the ground, crumpling up like this, getting these weird feelings and can't breathe and shit's fucking getting weird. And, um, that for me, that happened when I was also in, in what I thought was a peak moment in life. You know, I had just finished throwing the biggest beach party that the country had ever seen type thing. And, but it was very successful. Like there was high expectations coming into that event. You know, it was one of the first times I ever did an event that size, 20,000 people, uh, for five days. It was like heavy sponsors with big corporations putting in big money. There was politicians, there was celebrities, there was... It was an A-list sort of a thing, and I was in charge of it, and I was like, holy shit. And I did it, and it did very well, and I was super pumped about it, but I spent five days dehydrating myself, drinking gin and tonics, and barely sleeping. And at the end of it, I felt like I was on top of the world because we did well. Financially, it did well. So the, the, so the community in, embraced it. We did a really good, again, social awareness thing with beach cleanup and stuff. But my health suffered because I didn't take care of it at all. You know, I think I ate like 13 chicken wings and had 45 gin and tonics. And like, that was it for five days kind of thing and a bunch of Red Bull, you know? And so at the end of it, I, I had a seizure as well. I completely collapsed. And after that, when I came out of it, I also went through the thing, like, I thought I was doing everything right, even though kind of on the outside, it was obvious I wasn't, but internally I thought I was, and I never really thought about the health side of things, right? I was more focused on like delivering the experience for the guest getting the shareholders their return on it, making sure that the the mayor is happy with my beach cleanup. Like I had all these things that I had to do and I was like, yeah, we're doing pretty well with it. Um, but the health suffered. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, like the body's the driver, uh, excuse me, the body's the vehicle. Like it's the thing that's moving and doing the work, but your consciousness, like it's what drives you, right? So I think both you and I went through a consciousness paradigm shift after our health crises, right? Because you completely flipped over, you value health. Now you're doing an incredible, an awesome health protocol, which I'd like to ask you about. Um, and I switched over completely, stopped drinking, doing all these things at that paradigm shifting moment, both of our consciousness came up and it was like, Hey, you're fucking up your vehicle and you only get one of these vehicles. So if you want to live your best life, be there with, for, your, for your family forever, be old and gray with grandkids. You know, if you want to provide financially and, and have experiences and be able to travel and do all these things with this one vehicle we get, the consciousness inside you, it is telling you, take care of this vehicle. And so I think when your consciousness comes up and it comes into your, your conscious mind and you click like, oh shit, I can control my health and I need to fucking prioritize that now, you go to that next phase where you are now. Tell us about that. Yeah, so, I mean, when you follow Tony Robbins, and especially if you get in his inner circle, um, the the Planet Partnership, <clears throat> there was an event I went to in October of last year. Um, it can get kind of woo and all that kind of stuff if you're not used to this kind of stuff. I mean, there's one one um, kind of one exercise that Sage Robbins, his wife, um, did, and, 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 like, she got us to do it, and I started doing it. And I did it for a little while, and, you know, I've, I've, I've always, like, kind of switched my morning routine to, like, whatever I feel like doing that kind of it. But the one thing that she did is it's this thing where 
you you talk to your body. You pretty much speak to your body. You know, this is kind of like to what you're saying. And the thing was, you like you rub on your hands, your legs, anywhere. But for me, I would rub on my hands and I would say, thank you. I love you. Thank you. I love you. Right. And then I would do that with, you know, both hands. And I would do that for like two, three minutes. And some of you that are watching are like, what the fuck have you got yourself into? But it's very interesting when you want- What podcast did I land on here? You know what What's happening right now? But it's very interesting when you start becoming conscious of your body, especially because as humans, we live in our minds all the fucking time. The, the best moments in my day today, it's that first 15 minutes that I open my eyes. The first thing that I do now, granted, I live on the beach and it's beautiful outside and the, 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 the sun is always shining, and especially in Miami, it's like fucking warm all the time. So the first thing I do is I roll out of bed and then I go stand on the balcony and I wake up at six. So it's nice and cool. Then it's still kind of still dark out. The sun is just coming out and it just looks beautiful. But what my mind wants to do is immediately go into overdrive. Like, fuck, Suzanne said this. Okay, Aaron is doing that. What the fuck is the shield doing again? You know, and then automatically my mind wants to go into work. Fuck, Rowena said that a lot yesterday. Wait, what is Ginger needing to do? And then literally my mind was, and then. You have to interrupt it. You have to be very conscious and interrupt it and say, no, fuck all that. Let me just live in the moment. And what you need to do is you need to remove yourself, your conscious, your, your focus from here and then bring it here, bring it into your body. And once you do that, you will just feel this inner peace that I personally have never felt. Like I always thought of this stuff, like the whole meditation. When you first introduced meditation to me, this was... Literally right before my seizure, when you were talking about, you know, you always wear these necklaces and stuff like that. And I would be like, I don't know what the fuck this guy's into. I thought, oh, fuck all that. I remember the first time I tried to do like um, a guided meditation about manifestation. And I'm like, this is fucking weird. I don't know what this is about. <laughs> this is some weird shit, you know? And it just didn't feel right. But I feel like sometimes you need this leverage that gets created in life. And if you don't know how to create it, it will get created for you. And it's usually a punch in the fucking gut. For me, it was that seizure. And literally overnight, I completely changed because I went into survival mode. Because I was anxious all fucking day long. Didn't know if I was going to die, if I've got two months you know, left or three months. My fucking family doctor says they found a scratch in your brain. It's like, motherfucker, what does that mean? Right? And so I had to do all these things. And that's when I discovered meditation and stuff like that. And so just to answer your question, um, right now I do, and, and this is, again, this is a little excessive, you know, and I can afford it. Those of you that are watching, that's fine. You don't have to start here, but, you know, you could you could start small. If you're watching, the first thing that I would do is starting with a morning routine. And this doesn't have to be complicated. It could be 10 minutes where you can spend time with yourself. Remove your conscious, your focus from your head. Focus it into your body. And I know, Aaron, you've got a lot to talk about when it comes to this topic. But spend time in priming yourself. Spend time in conditioning yourself, conditioning your body. And just spend time 10 minutes in the morning. And as Tony says, if you don't have 10 minutes for yourself, you don't fucking have a life, right? Um, and just really just figure out a morning routine that, whether that's a prayer, whether that's uh, something thinking about things that you could be grateful for, whether that's, uh, um, you know, right now I do, I do Tony Robbins uh, priming. Literally just go to Tony to, to YouTube and type Tony Robbins priming. It's a 15 minute thing. It's an incredible uh, 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 it's an incredible exercise. And maybe Aaron, you can tell us a little bit more about that. But outside of that, I do uh, red light therapy. I do oxygen therapy. I do acupuncture. Um, you know, I try to do as you uh, like you. I do heat and cold. So I do sauna or like I don't have a plunge, but I I have the beach, so I'll like dip in the beach. Um, and exercise. You need to exercise. You yeah. don't fucking move your body. I exercise four times a week. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, man. You got to move your cells. The cells need to, ex and like you know, get rid of toxins, right? And they do that through vibrating and, and exercising and things. Man, this stuff—it's it, so fascinating. All this stuff, and I love all that all that thing you're talking about. Uh, one of the things that I've um, started doing here is cryotherapy. So it's like you, you stand in that tube and it's like minus five million degrees or whatever, and you're in there freezing your balls off. Have you ever seen that? Yeah. The smoke? Yeah. yeah. 
So have you ever done that? Like it's fucking cold in there. No, but I think who said the one time you did it here at the carry on next door, right? Carolyn. Yeah, no, I did it there too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that hotel right next to your to your house there. Yeah. Um, I did it there. Yeah. But they have it they have it also in our place in, in Switzerland. They have um like a cryo, like a a tube. And you go in there. So what I do is I go in the sauna and get hot and go back and forth in the sauna, cold shower, blah, blah, blah. And then at the end of that on the way out, there's a red light bed and there's a, a cryo. And you can hit those two things on the way out. And then they also have a massage place and an acupuncture. And it's all in this like one facility. So again, health is wealth. These types of things, number one, take money. Definitely, it's not cheap to do that stuff. But two, you have to have the time and the bandwidth to do that stuff. If I look back on my life in when I was working corporate or when I was, when I was working in nine to five jobs, if I could like fast forward and tell myself now that I would spend like a solid four to three, four hours in the morning, because we live in Europe, right? So our work day starts in the afternoon, but it's like, I spent a good chunk of the morning, like six, 7 AM until uh, like nine or 10 AM all on just me. Like my wife and I will work on ourself. Right? We'll do our morning stuff. We'll go to the gym. We'll do all that stuff we talked about, reading, meditating, breath work, go for a swim, like so much filling your own cup. It's just, it's a game changer. And to your point about like your brain starts going crazy in the morning. Something that I've realized is like, it, and maybe at home you've, you've felt this too. In the morning, I have a shit ton of like anxiety and negative thoughts and like overwhelm and like, oh my God, the world's burning. I feel that in the mornings and the, the routine and the stuff you're talking about separates you from that. It allows you to be in the moment. And then for me, as the day progresses and it gets later into the evening, I have more and more conviction and confidence in like the world's not burning. Actually, the world is amazing and everything's awesome. And the business is, you know, like everything's perfect by the end of the day when I go to bed, then I wake up in the morning again and I'm back to like, oh shit. And I got this anxiety. Um, and again, focusing on your health, focusing on moving your body, hydration, all these types of things. That is how you can pull yourself out of that possible down spiral in the morning and get yourself primed for the rest of the day. You know, one thing, this is two tips for you, Aaron. Two things right. that I started doing uh, a month ago that helped me with that because for me, it was anxiety about, oh, fuck, I'm awake. That's another opportunity for a seizure to happen, right? And so two things that I started implementing, the minute that my eyes are open up before I even walk into walk, in, walk to the balcony, is number one, I know my goals for the year. And I just ask myself the question, literally my, the first thing, like my eyes just open. I like, I step on the side of the bed. I ask myself, what is one thing I'm going to do today that will move me closer to any of my goals? And the question, the answer comes out like immediately. And then my head kind of gets busy with that. And then the second thing that I do is I start playing a song that I love in my head. And for me, it's the eye of the, t the tiger, right? The, the Rocky Balboa theme song. So it's like the fucking morning starts with like rocket and shit. And it's like, there's no room for yeah. negativity there. You know what I mean? And it's like, my body gets in the mood. And it's like, fuck it. And I'm thinking of like Rocky, like, you know, I'm like, all right, let's go. You know what I mean? And so that's helped me tremendously. Now I've been thinking about this because I'm like, I am almost 100% sure 90% of people that are watching this podcast are probably me and you five, six, seven years ago when we had no time to even think about this stuff that we're talking about right now or even listen to this shit and if we heard it we'd be like go fuck yourself it's easy for you to say asshole right mm -hmm. and so i'm just thinking i'm like you know because my my my, my coach my therapist always telling me you know she, she's always well you know research shows that if you take a vacation or if you take breaks or whatever it's you know like it, it makes you like last longer and the question that i always ask her is like Okay, let me ask you a question. Had I taken breaks, <clears throat> had I taken slower, had I done these things as I was building six, seven, eight years ago, would I have been here now? She's like, that's a great question. What if you would have been two times further than when you are now? And I'm yeah. like, oh, fuck, that's interesting. I haven't thought about that. That's what I thought immediately. What if you went further? Yeah. Right? Immediately, my brain went, you'd be further. Yeah, and it, because at least it's like, well, fuck, like, 
naturally, I go into gear every time there is like a, a downfall or something like that, right? We recently had a thing with marketing, with our marketing team and stuff like that. Immediately, I go into gear and I'm like that person that's like, fucking work. Like I just smash my face down and I'm just like, go. You know what I mean? It's like, I've got one fucking, it's like, I've got one, one, uh, one, what's it called? One shift. You know, it's like, go. And it's one, just like, one gear. It's literally like, just go, right? And, and like, yeah. You know, some of our team likes their weekends, like they Saturday Sundays, and and I fucking hate Saturday Sundays because like I can't reach anyone. It's like fucking motherfuckers, like answer my goddamn like I have all this stuff that I have to fucking get done. You fucking you piece of shit assholes, you know. And in the back, I'm like, who sucks? Relax, you know. They need their breaks. They're gonna come back Monday fresh to fucking crush it, you know, because fucking you know research shows that blah blah blah. And so, yeah, it's like is there a middle ground? And honestly, when I'm thinking about it, I'm like, you know what? You know what would have definitely helped me? Two things. Maybe three things. Number one, a morning, a solid 10, 15 minute morning, not routine, but priming, conditioning, putting me in the right state. Yeah. Because I remember when I had my restaurant, bro, I would wake up, I was in survival mode 24 fucking seven. And I was in reactionary mode 24-7. I was not proactive. And this is one of the reasons why my restaurant failed. Because I was always reacting to problems. And it was always like, all right, fuck, I've put out five fires. Okay, I have room for two more. Okay, what the fuck you got? All right, let's go, let's tackle this. You know what I mean? And it was always like reacting, putting out fires. But this morning stuff, what it does is it like kind of relaxes you. So that you can kind of take a step back and say, okay, these are the four things that I have to deal with. Which one is the middle mover? Let me attack this. And if I attack this, probably all this other stuff will fall off. Right? That's the first thing. The second thing I would say, prioritize your fucking sleep. Seven, eight hours a day. Prioritize that, man. It's not about the it's not about the time that you're awake. Or it's not about the time that you're wasting while sleeping. It's about how efficient you are when you when you wake up. And number two, that mean number three. I would say feed, feed your body and your mind, feed your body and your mind. And this is surrounding yourself with the right people. This is, uh, uh um, reading books, listening to podcasts, um, in physical, physical, like work, cardio, running, swimming, you know, I mean, this could be like 30, 45 minutes of your day. You could get all the shit done. Absolutely, man. Yeah. That for me, that, um, focusing on the morning, the morning activities, and the health and the fuel and again less is more remove removing certain toxins and replacing them with different toxins uh that are good for you or not toxins but you know what i mean Re -re replacing shitty stuff with good stuff and focusing on health for me that was the catalyst that changed my trajectory for sure no question it was like health was the thing yes. right i went from party animal you know complete disaster shit show guy to who you see now, the first thing that changed was my wife was like, Hey, maybe you should join me with yoga. And I'm like, yeah, maybe I should. So yoga was at 5 AM every day. And I was like, Jesus, I'm just getting home. Literally. Like I would roll in on my motorbike at 4:49, and yoga would be a five. And I'd be like, well, I'm fucking committed to yoga. I'll go. And I'd show up there and I'd be like, namaste everybody. And I was like out of it, but I would see the people there and I would look at them and they would have crystal white eyes flexible, lean. And I'm like, damn, these humans are like on fire. Like they're fucking peak performing health wise. And I was inspired by it, you know, and I would feel great after it. I'd feel super light. We'd go to the, on, for a walk on the beach, go for a swim. And I'd be like, man, I feel so good. Then I started thinking like, well, what if I wasn't fucking half wasted showing up? That'd probably help. And then well, what if I actually slept the night before? That would probably help too. You know, I should actually replace X, Y, Z substance with like some, uh, creatine, that might be a good idea. So like I started making these shifts and as I did that, I started, well, maybe I could read a book or two because I'm not feeling hungover and I don't want to sleep. Okay. Well, let's, let's read that book from Tony Robbins. And all of a sudden it starts this path and you start going down on this journey and it all started. Yeah. For me, the health crisis of the seizure and the, the, the shit that I went through just like you, and then realizing I needed to change my lifestyle and then actually making that small change of starting yoga. And then seeing people that have been on the journey for a long time and where they're at and being super inspired by it. So again, it was the community of people who were like-minded, who are ahead on the journey that I could learn from. 
And then I could see my own progress. They'd be like, good job, man. Like you can't touch your toes yet, but maybe in a month you will. Oh, you're getting closer. Good job, man. Keep pushing. And I was like, yes. Meanwhile, they're like pretzeling themselves. And I'm like, holy shit, but it's not about them. It's about your own journey, yeah. right? Not comparing yourself to other people. So what do, what do you think about, so we're talking about the pillars of what success is basically, right? So we went through health a little bit. Let's talk wealth. Mm. Wealth. Okay. So there's different types of wealth, right? When I look at wealth, I see like, okay, there's money. There's, you can have experiences to me. Are you wealthy if you have experiences? Yes. So let's talk about wealth, man. I know we have one saying in the company. Uh, what is it about options or choice? Yeah. I mean, having freedom of choice, right? Hmm. What does that mean? So the last maybe like six months or so of my restaurant journey, <clears throat> On my way driving to the restaurant, it was like 10 minutes away from my house. I used to be thinking about, on my way home tonight, what would I have done that would make me a little wealthier than I am right now? And at first, it was always about like money. Okay, we need to make more money than yesterday, last week, last month, whatever. And then it shifted to, okay, wealth is not just about money. Wealth is about relationships. Wealth is about your footprint in the community. Are you leaving a positive footprint or a negative footprint? Wealth is about taking care of other people, taking care of your own personal, you know, personal health or personal uh, 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 relationships with people. And so personally for me, wealth is right now, at least for my pillars, for my five pillars, wealth is Part of it is like money and, and, and finances and stuff like that. But the other part is legacy. The other part is mm -hmm. how do I build something that way after I'm gone still lives on and can continue to change the world, right? Like when I look at Steve Jobs, like this is the, the biggest inspiration for me. When I look at Steve Jobs, he's built one of the best companies and the biggest companies in, in today's history, right? And uh, in today's world. And um, when you look at like how he started and when he went away, where Apple was and what, where Apple is, like every, for me, every time people say Apple, I think Steve Jobs. I don't think iPhone or my computer or whatever. I think Steve Jobs, right? And, and I feel like he's left such an incredible footprint, you know, after reading the book Made in America, which I suggest to everyone here um, by Sam Walton, the founder of Walmart. It's like, imagine how that company changed commerce and how Walmart has completely changed how we shop, you know? Um, I think they employ nearly a million people. When you look at Amazon, I mean, Jeff Bezos is still, still pretty young, but after Jeff is gone, I'm pretty sure Amazon is going to continue employing millions of people and changing the world, changing how commerce is done all around the world. When you look at Thomas Edison, it's like, holy fuck. How long ago was that? Until this day, we're like living all the stuff that he built, you know? Henry Ford. Like, these are incredible people that built something out of necessity, added value to people, solved a huge problem, and the thing that they built is continuing to transform how we do things, you know? And so for me, this is what wealth truly is. What is it for you? Oh, I love that. No, I love that. That's yeah. Legacy is something. Um, well, one of the things that when I hear the word wealth, obviously, you know, immediately you, you, my brain goes to like money and all this kind of stuff, materialism and things like the, the brainwashing is real. Right. So it's like, oh, you know, and then I think to what Tony was saying at the business mastery event we were at yeah. and he was telling the story of yes. Okay. Material things are fine. And one of the biggest uh, things you can do with wealth is buy things. If you have money, you can buy shit. Absolutely. But experiences are the juice of life, yeah. right? Like sitting at home, you're like, oh, I want to travel. I want to do this with my family. I want to take my kids there. Like that's, that's what life is. That's what it's all about. There's nothing else. It's just experiences after experiences. That's it. So what Tony was talking about, he told the story of his, um, I think he was an employee of his that loved this certain type of a Corvette car, a vintage Corvette. Mm. 
And he said, you know, because I had the financial means to do it, I wanted to create an experience for my employee. And so he went, he bought this car for the guy and he parked it at some hotel and he told the guy, like the guy was being rewarded for being a good worker. Right. And he told him, Hey man, um, I met the conference room at the Hyatt hotel. It's Christmas night. I know you're with your family, but I really need you. Like shit's going down in the company. I need you here. Please come help me. And the guy, of course, he's loyal. And he was like, I'll be there. And so he drove to the hotel. Tony's there waiting for him. And this guy walks by the Corvette and he's like, holy shit, that's the Corvette I've always been talking about. I love that thing. And Tony's like, what are you talking about? He's like, that's the Corvette. I love that Corvette. I want that Corvette. That's the one you see on my vision board all the time. And Tony's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Let's get in the conference room and get to work. He's like, okay, fine. But look at the Corvette. He's like, yeah, great. As they walk by the Corvette, Tony goes, well, hold, hold on. Why don't you just, that'll just stand by it. Take a picture. He's like, I'll take a picture with you. He's like, okay, cool. Yeah. Take a picture, picture. It's like, well, why don't you just open the door and uh, poke your head in and take a look around. And the guy's like, I can't do that. I can't do that. And the guy pokes his head. He gets in there. Tony's like, well, just sit in the driver's seat. No one's going to see you, man. There's no one here. Just get in the driver's seat. I'll take a fast picture of you. It'll be great. So the guy gets in the driver's seat. And as he sits down in the driver's seat in his dream car, Tony's taking a picture of him. Instead of taking a camera out, he passes him a key. And he says, thank you for being a wonderful employee. I, I, I appreciate your hard work. And the guy looked up at him and he couldn't believe him. He said, oh my God, are you serious? You're giving me this car. I love it. Thank you so much. I've always wanted this. You know, we're, we're here for life. Let's do it. And Tony explained how he used his financial wealth to be able to buy a material good that was very expensive and give it to someone he loved to have that person experience what it felt like on the other end of that. To me, that kind of stuff is wealth. I'm always thinking about how I can do things for people. And of course, things cost money. Good luck finding free things. I'm always thinking how I can have an experience with someone, surprise someone with a plane ticket, plan a trip, plan a reunion, do something that I will cover that will bring an amazing experience of love, love vibes to everyone involved. To me, that is, is, is wealth for me. I love that. I mean, I fuck it. It made me emotional. Um, experience is definitely something that we, I think, uh, I think it's underrated actually. Uh, and not a lot of people think about them because the first thing that we think about when we are trying to make money is like, uh, you know, I want to buy the car. I want to buy the house. I want to buy the, the, you know, I want to do this. I want to do that. But the, the, the one thing that I, that doesn't, um, that doesn't, uh, um, you know, a lot of people don't think about is creating those experiences because I'm pretty sure that guy will remember that moment for the rest of the moment, life, right? It's yes. that moment. It's like, you know, um, Tony talks about it all the time. It's that like, um, like he says, all, almost always in all of his conferences, he's like, in the show of hands, who remembers exactly where they were on the day of 9-11. And literally 90% of the room raises their hand, right? Because yeah. emotional, you know, situations that have an emotional impact on you, they get into your body, they get into your brain, you can never forget them, right? And so if you are able to create an emotion for someone else, that's an experience. Like that, what you're talking about, is an experience for that person that he will never forget for the rest of his life. And maybe even the moment yeah. when he received the car more than the actual car, you know? Now, obviously, the car itself is going to probably create a ton of experiences and a ton of memories that he will, you know, pass on and, and get to enjoy with uh, with his family and loved ones. Um, but I love that, man. I never thought about it that way, actually. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's fascinating because, you know, one of the pillars that you mentioned as well, and of course it's on mine is family, right? Yes. And so family is a huge thing. And we always talk about your, you know, your identity. It's like, are you fulfilling your identity? Are you living to the true identity of who you believe you should be or want to be? Right. And all of us have the identity, of, the identity of wanting to be a provider or a helper of sorts. Right. This is why people are like, yeah, I want to retire my, my spouse. I want to retire my parents. I want to do it for the kids. You're being a provider. And so creating experiences for the people around you and having them feel that emotional rush is literally 
like optimal provider land. You know what I mean? Because you're giving them that moment in time and people don't remember their life. They remember moments and you are responsible for helping provide that for them because you want to provide that for people more than they want to provide it for themselves. So if you truly love someone, truly love your family, it's your duty to provide experiences that they will remember a lifetime because that's why you're there. And likewise, vice versa, that's why they're there for you. And also on the side note, when you're providing experience for other people, Tony will remember that, that moment as well. He, he told us about it. So he obviously remembers it. It's impactful for him to tell thousands of people. So you also remember the moments when you are doing the act also when you're receiving, right? Let's talk about family. That's on your pillars. Me as well. Um, how, how, how is, you know, running a business or, or living the lifestyle you do, where does family come in there as far as, as fulfillment and, and happiness with your pillars in life? Yeah. So it's very interesting. So the pillar that I have is actually relationships and not family specifically. And the reason being Oh, is, relationships. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. And the reason being is because, you know, there is the, 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 the chosen family and kind of the, the non-chosen family. Right. And I feel like sometimes the non-chosen family, the family that's kind of like forced down our throat is really not the family that you want to, to have around or something like that. Right. But at the end of the day, I feel like it's the relationships that truly matter um, because I, I don't know where I read at one time, they surveyed like 10 billionaires or something like that. And they were like, hey, if you, if you, if you were to think, if you like were to go back and, and if there was one thing that you would rather, like you would want to change in your life, what would it be? And they said, I think the survey came back with like 89% of them or something like that said, create more meaningful relationships. Right. Um, and the reason why I put that on my pillars is because when my seizure happened, when I had that moment of like truth and coming to Jesus, you know, I realized that mm. I felt lonely. Like I started feeling lonely. I'm like, what the fuck? Where is that coming from? And what I realized is that like I had isolated myself. Not only had I completely removed from myself and, and like, got away from my family, which I think was a positive thing. I mean, I still love them and I still go see them and stuff like that. But I also had, like, I didn't have any meaningful relationships. You know, I think me and you have a pretty meaningful relationship. You know, we talk about life and stuff like that outside of work. But my relationship with a lot of our team, I mean, I would say maybe like 70, 80% of it is evolved around business. You know, when we talk, it's mostly we're talking about work and stuff like that. Now I try to have one-on-ones and stuff like that and talk about like, how their life is and share and that kind of stuff. But 70, 80% of our conversations is work related, you know? And although that's great, but it's like, that's not how you create meaningful relationships. You know, meaningful relationships come in when you become vulnerable with someone, when you don't have to put a filter on, when you can just be yourself and say whatever the fuck you want, when you want, when you can call someone at two o'clock in the morning and cry on the phone if you wanted to, you know, or whatever it is. Or maybe it's someone that you create those, you know, meaningful experiences you were talking about earlier so personally for me i believe it's all about relationships and with relationships come those experiences what about you yeah yeah no that that's 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 spot on man with relationships comes those experiences yeah that's true that's true it's like <clears throat> we talked a lot about um you know building uh, sustainable and socially responsible business ventures, right? And we talked about lessons we've learned as entrepreneurs, and we've talked about what success looks like to us. And if you look at those three or four things that we've kind of generally touched on here in the last little bit, if you kind of go behind the curtain of all of them, it's all about relationships, right? You talk about the foundation and you talk about the lady who lives down the street from you who is working with your wife to, you know, work towards the next foundation um, experience for the people we're going to help, right? We talk about the lessons we learn. And, you know, I was talking about everything that I learned at that music festival. And it was all revolving around all the different parties of people that I was working beside and learning from and, and, and being accountable to. Those were all relationships. We're talking about what a success looked like. We're talking about giving experiences to the people we love. 
and receiving experiences from the people we love. Every single one of these things is relationship foundation. We're sitting here right now building a relationship. We're building a relationship with the audience. You're building a relationship with our brand. We build relationships with our students. Our students build relationships with the coaches. Our internal team builds relationships with each other. We have fucking pizza days on Sunday where we get together and eat pizza and talk shit on Zoom. Like it's all about relationships, right? It's fascinating stuff. So yeah, I would say to, to kind of summarize all of that, it's like if you can double down on your relationships and come in with good intentions and provide value and solutions to problems, I'd say if you're looking to break away from the grind or you want to add another income stream or leave corporate or whatever you want to do, if you come into it with the lens of I'm here to be a valuable asset to this relationship, I'm here to solve a problem someone has around me and I'm going to listen more than I speak, I would say you're positioning yourself to actually be successful in whatever venture that may, whether it's Amazon or something else, it doesn't matter. If you come in with that mindset, you're setting yourself up to do very well. And if you can top that up with focusing on your health and your morning routines, the world's your oyster, man. Thank you.